All right, for those folks that are joining, we are gonna give um, attendees a minute or two to uh, join the webinar and then we will begin. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for our virtual discussion and live demo of Bracklet's benchmark integrations with Grez and lead reporting. My name is Matt Lynch, I'm the Chief Product Officer at Bracklet and I'll be facilitating today's discussion and leading the live demo. First, we'll dive into discussions with our panelists, Dan Winters, Head of Americas at Grez, and Chris Pike, SVP of product at ARC, about the value and importance of ESG reporting integrations. From there, we'll go into the demo so all of you can see firsthand what the hype is all about. We will then open it up to all of you so you can ask us and our panelists any questions you may have. So please submit any questions you have to the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Additionally, we'll be recording today's webinar for everybody's convenience and we'll provide a link later this week to all attendees. So to start off with, Dan, do you mind telling the audience a bit about your background? Sure, hi everybody, I'm Dan Winters. I'm Head of Americas with GRESB. We are the global benchmark used for environmental, social, and governance attributes between institutional investors and those that are managing their money, typically private equity firms and listed property companies. Globally, last year, there were 1,230 participants in the GRESB assessment, and that covered close to 100,000 assets. Roughly a third of them were from the United States in count, but believe me, the capital under management is, is here. So there's a lot of impact that's happening and a lot of progress that is, that is also happening in the industry. So let me just stop there. I'm sure that I'll weave other things in, Matt, uh, but thanks <laughs> a lot for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Um, Chris, let's tell people a little bit about you as well. Absolutely. It's fun to be here with you and Dan. And, and so first off, I'm Chris Pike. For those who don't know me, I, I help run a part of the US GBC and GBCI ecosystem called ARC. ARC is the part of our family of organizations that focuses on measuring, scoring, and celebrating the real world performance of spaces, buildings, and places. We work closely with tools such as GRESP to provide that information Dan was talking about to uh, institutional investors and other stakeholders. We also work very intimately with Fortune 500 companies around the world as part of their ESG programs. And so also have the pleasure of working directly with Dan while I was COO for, uh, for GRESP and we've all been part of on this journey together. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for being here. All right, so the first part um, of our webinar today is gonna be a panel discussion um, with everybody here, and then we'll dive into that live demo. So I'm gonna have, I have a couple prompts that we'll, we'll get the conversation started, um, and I'll dive into the first. So uh, I really wanted to start our discussion with um, the idea, do you believe that uh, we will continue to see more commercial properties adhere to higher standards of decarbonization and ESG performance. Who's this grab bag? Who's taking it? <laughs> Sounds like me. I spoke up first. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think that we're only getting we're only getting started. We're only starting to roll. And there's a lot of pressures that are happening top down, right? And that's where Grez thrives. We have a, a cadre of institutional investors that have gotten together and said, what's happening out there when it comes to sustainability? Who's implementing best practices? And how do I wanna be directionally correct with my capital going forward? So that's on the one hand. The other hand is regulation. So last month, the EU uh, stepped forward with the SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulations, 
and they put everybody on notice, whether you have a green fund that's labeled as such, or just a regular old standard fund that's happened throughout my career, uh, there's metrics and measures and disclosures that uh, uh, people are looking for. So all of this devolves down to a data conversation. That's why we're, we're here today, because the data is the data. And in essence, this is a roll up of metrics. We've been able to do this on the finance side, starting from you know as way back as the 1934 Act uh, to, to harmonize financials because every portfolio is made up of a bunch of buildings and every one of those buildings has a profit and loss statement of their own P&L. So you have to bring those together and issue annual reports to your, uh, to your shareholders, in many instances, LPs, if it's private equity. And so that construct is the same thing here, only now we're talking about non-financial data, consumption data, energy, water, waste, greenhouse gas emission consumption. So we're in the early stages of this. Gresd has been around now for 12 years. The building labels have been around for 20. I think Energy Star is celebrating 22 this year. So um, yeah, it's, it's, only, it's only getting uh, more intense out there. And the last thing I'll say is we do have some headwinds, right? Headwinds are lease structures. Triple net lease, difficult to get data. But the industry is, is, is coming up with ways and breaking these things down and engaging tenants. And so, you know, the, 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 the decade ahead, a lot of promise. Every commercial property is, 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 that's institutionally owned is going to be part of this. Chris, what do you think? I, I mean, I'll, I'll, let me layer on that. I, I'll, first, I'll start with, uh, with Amen. That, that is clearly true, all that stuff. I would also say that the, to add on to what Dan said, I think that we are seeing, a, 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 there's no way around it to say it. We are simply seeing a raising of the bar, a greater expectation for what property as part of entire organizations is doing. That means we need to be able to answer the question of, first, first and foremost, being transparent with management and with stakeholders. There's no question that transparency comes first. But beyond transparency, then we need to be able to answer questions such as, are you vulnerable to climate risk? Are you on track for Paris targets? Do you face transition risk? How do you compare to your peers and, and, and absolute standards? So those questions which might have felt exotic or unusual five or 10 years ago are increasingly mainstream. It's increasingly not credible to not know the answers to those questions. And so I think what we're seeing is whether we're working at the investor scale, the entity scale, or the asset scale, we see a demand for transparency. We see demand for knowing where you stand and being able to articulate where you are on a decarbonization runway. And that there's other issues as well, but those are some of the ones that stick out for us. Yeah, it really feels like the, uh, the conversation has moved from, you know, can we collect this data to, okay, now we, what, what are we doing with this? How are we improving? And uh, that downward pressure uh, that Dan, you were describing um, is really creating, I would say, some, some challenges um, for, I'm thinking specifically, asset management teams, property teams, sustainability consultants, to begin actually managing all this information. Um, would you guys uh, comment a little bit on the challenges that you're seeing um, with uh, that collection and management of the information? Well, I'll go first, and I'll go keep it tight, which is change is hard. And you know the change that's happening is, can you acquire this data? And, and then why, right? Because absent the pricing signal, uh, you know, it, it just hasn't been, it's been important, but not urgent. So mm -hmm. I think the urgency is, is increasing. I talked about the headwinds with uh, lease structures, right? That, mm -hmm. And if you're in that kind of situation, that's a tenant engagement, or it's having some sort of uh, meter up the pipe, so you can mm -hmm. get this stuff before it gets to the tenant. That's a technical solution. That is the biggest challenge, right? It's always been the challenge of Grez, can you acquire the data? Um, and, and it takes either a technology or, or a group of humans to get together to make it so. Um, but that's, I don't know, that's what I see. Chris? What, what you yeah, I'll build on that again. So I, I think that that's, again, I'm in. And the, the I, I see how this is going to go, and so so I I'll, I'll add three or four things to that in terms of maybe a little more granular in terms of saying, I don't know when I, when I, when when you talk about it that way, I I see challenges with persistent challenges with data quality, 
data resolution, the kind of persistence of automated data connections and the kind of scope and extent of stuff. Let me, let me say what I mean by that. One is quality. Is it, is the data accurate and, and, and is it timely? Is it, is it within bounds? It, it, it is so simple to say and so hard to do. The second one is resolution. So up to now, um, a lot of our, a lot of our reporting in terms of temporal resolution, it's been focused on annual aggregates of information. Well, annual aggregates may be great for CDP, but they are not that road to improvement. Not that you were that you were talking about. We need to get to monthly data, ideally daily data, maybe hourly data, because our sources of energy supply and so forth are are varying at that level. So if you look at what Google's doing with twenty four seven twenty four seven zero net carbon, that requires getting down to hourly. That is what the future looks like. The third part I'll say is, is, is persistence. It is one thing to set these systems up once to do one round of annual reporting. It is another thing to keep them operating day on day, month on month, year on year for a substantial period into the future. That is a different trick. And, and what I see is that almost anybody can get it done once but the leaders are able to create it, sustain it, and then leverage it as part of their enterprise going forward. That's a different challenge. And I, and I think that's part of what we're here to discuss today. And what's so cool about this conversation is I just, you know, I'm zooming through the world. And so I just spent two hours on a call where I was in the vortex of, well, it's just the data. Of course it should be. Why can't, why is this so hard? Right. And that's somebody who's an institutional investor that has billions of dollars in real estate. But the reality on the ground is exactly what Chris said. You need timely data, it needs to persist. I mean, all of that stuff, it's hard. So um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is this disconnect between where you sit in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And almost a, a undercurrent, um, you know, to define that difficulty is that, you know, there are differences uh, when you're trying to standardize that data differences in, in building type and design and utilization. And so that creates further complexity complexity in defining those, those data collection processes. So um, I'm really, you know, I think it's important to highlight uh, the challenges uh, that we're facing. Um, and, you know, as part of that, I wanted to um, ask another question. So both LEAD and Grez have invested in creating uh, APIs for third parties to go access. So lead um, with the, the ARC team, and then Grez has also invested in APIs as well. And I wanted to um, ask you two how, um, how that effort uh, has helped alleviate maybe some of these challenges and really, you know, why did both certification, why did you both go down that route? You're first this time. All right, that's pretty easy. I, and I, actually, what I'll do, Madison, let me ask you, let me answer your previous, let me add one quick thing to your previous question. Okay. That the other thing about type and utilization, you, you nailed it by saying, hey, these things vary by space type and they vary by utilization. There's one thing we've learned through COVID is that, hey, our assets are incredibly dynamic. So a static view of our of whether it's occupancy or income or energy consumption, we have needed to get an unprecedented degree of, of dynamism in that representation. So I just want to really echo what you said. So when it comes to APIs, that's not unrelated. So APIs, obviously, application programming interfaces, a very a, 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 a an increasingly common um, tool. We have embraced that because we, we don't want people touching data. <laughs> I, ideally, we want the data to flow from the meter to up to the asset, from the asset to the enterprise. We, we, and when people touch data, bad things happen. So we uh, either they're wasting their time, they're messing it up, or 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 it's slowing it down. So at the end of the day, uh, I, I think our future here is at, at, at a bare minimum. Our future is digital. We we want a digital chain of custody for consumption data, and we don't want people in that loop. People don't bring much don't bring any value when we're moving ones and zeros around. So we see a future where automated data connections through a, a fluid ecosystem of partners, whether you're sending it to GRASP, to CDP, to ARC, to LEAD, that, that is a digital experience uh, from a common set of data. And that we're all we're all on a journey to get there, but that's that's our hope. Yeah, and I think the word common is key, right? Because the data is the data. It doesn't change whether it's in anybody's system. So um, let's break down friction and, and get the, the ones and twos and zeros and nines and to the right spot. That, that's really what it's all about. Because otherwise, you know, it's just a burden. 
And the reality is we're better off spending our time making efficiency gains or you know other asset level insights than wrangling data. So let's make it simple. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and um, you know I, that just brings back uh, that initial uh, makes me think of the initial point that I think Dan you were making, which is you know there's pathways and automation uh, that have been standard for a long time with financial information. And so now what we're doing is we're breaking down and defining and standardizing those channels and pathways for more of this operational information that's needed to assess these assets. With our challenge at Grez, we've got you know 1,200 funds and in, in, in listed property companies. They come from all over the globe. So in order to receive that data in, we naturally had to build this API. So we have uh, a lot of data partners in various locales around the globe who are feeding this in, in our annual rhythm. So right now in the second quarter, the Grezb assessment is open. We've got people that are in there, they're answering you know, questions about policies and procedures and, and, and whatnot, but there's that whole other asset level data question. So mm -hmm. data starts to flow in from the UK, from Australia, from the US, from lots of different places, lots of different partners. People still use spreadsheets, so that's a thing. Right? We're trying to get out of the spreadsheet business because that incorporates or you know, it introduces human error. And I think we've already been touching on this, um, but I wanted to see if uh, Chris or Dan, if you wanted to add anything else you know, to, to really highlight um, the impact and opportunities that this da better data management um, will create. I think one quick thing I might add is saying, mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing around the world is that there are, you know, we have a consistent desire, A, to create transparency, and, and, and that's, that's important. But it's also there are multiple ways to interpret those data to define leadership. And, and, and whether, in other words, are you leading? Are you lagging? Are you on track? Are you exploiting these opportunities? And I, I think that as we do our work, we find we're kind of going up and down in scale. We are constantly getting having a broader engagement at what Dan would call the entity scale, the, the, the portfolio, the fund, the company, but we're also going down and getting more granular. You know, how do you understand if a uh, consumer products factory is efficient or whether a warehouse is, is, is operating correctly or whether you are balancing a, a, a infection control and, and energy efficiency in an office building? Th these are granular decisions that need that are actually now powered by a new generation of data, whether it's sensors in the building, whether it's at the meter. So these are pretty exciting. So I just want to say that what we see is both a moving up in scale, dealing with whole portfolios in a very grasp style way. We also see the data taking us downwards into more finely grained distinctions between spaces and space types and helping folks kind of meet those space types where they are. In the past, we might have left them behind, essentially. And now we're now the data is allowing us to have a more, a more bespoke fit, sort of mass customization style. So a lot to unpack there, but I just wanted to share that kind of up and down flavor that our work takes us into today. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's perfect. And, and I think about it from the, from the higher level, which is, you know, the big bugaboo question in Grez, getting back a decade, can you acquire this data? So now, once you get over the why, why should I do this? And, and you do it, guess what? You have more information and you find out if you've got a portfolio of 120 buildings, hey, these are my top 20 buildings up here. I didn't know that before. Now I do. And oh, down here, these, they need some help. They need some CapEx, some OpEx, some coaching, something, right? And so now we can start looking what's happening up here that we can apply down here. And the conversation just becomes so rich. Before that, you had maybe some uh, thoughtfully enlightened asset managers that were fighting for budget. Hey, I want to do all the things that Chris was talking about because I've got this great building and I need to position it in the marketplace. So it just, it's, it's another lens into that conversation that drives it forward. And, you know, I, I just think it's great. Well, thank you, Chris and Dan. That was amazing perspective and great context uh, for today's demo covering these two new integrations to the Bracket platform, Grez and Lead. Um, so what I'm going to do, we're going to move into the next section of our webinar today, um, and that is going to be all the demo. Don't worry for the, the folks listening in. That will not be the last time that you hear from Chris and Dan. They're going to be active in this demo. Um, 
and and helping me really tell the story. And I guarantee you, you don't want to hear my voice for 25 straight minutes. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Very good. Chris and Dan, if you wouldn't mind giving me just a quick thumbs up that you can see the ESG roll up. Perfect. All right. Um, okay. So like I was mentioning, we want to highlight our two new integrations with Grez and Lead. Um, this is in addition to our existing integration with Energy Star that we will not be covering today. Um, but I'll be demoing how by automating the collection of ESG data, you can effectively move your portfolio down the path of first measuring where you are, next strategizing how you improve, and then acting on those chosen initiatives. And so we're gonna begin right here on the ESG rollup, which centralizes all of your ESG scores automatically and allows teams to easily report on progress and keep track of missing or out of date information. Next, we'll dive into LEAD and demonstrate how easy it is to keep your operational data up to date and the benefits of doing so. Then we'll run through our GREZ integration, which shows how technology can create a central repository of information that streamlines ESG submissions. Okay, so let's begin here with the ESG rollup. Uh, we automatically collect and manage lead, GREZ, and ENERGY STAR information portfolio-wide. We know that these scores can typically live in many places, from reports to Excel workbooks, which makes it hard to uh, track down and create the complete picture of a portfolio's progress. So that's why I want to first highlight these top panels of the roll-up information that we designed to bring all of this ESG scoring into one place and automatically keep track of your year-over-year -year improvement. So I'm gonna start with LEAD. Uh, what this is showing is the current uh, breakdown of where buildings are in their certification path. So we can see that one building is uh, platinum certified, two are gold, one is silver, and then one is still unrated. And we can also jump into the history. So we can see in 2018, there were three buildings that were unrated with zero platinum, zero gold. And then that moves to 2020, where we now have one building that's unrated. And now one is platinum and two are gold. Next, looking at the GREZ panel, um, the 2020 reporting year is open uh, and has been since April 1st. Um, I get some silent snaps uh, from Dan. <laughs> uh, and so it's anyone who's overseeing, um, you know, the, the submission of our portfolio of GREZ um, data is going to be focused on what buildings have been submitted and QA'd and what buildings still need attention um, to bring that entire portfolio to its final submittal. And then last, we have Energy Star. And so under Energy Star, we're tracking that year over year um, average score in a portfolio. So in 2019, you can see that the average score was 78. And 2020, the average score went up to 81. We can also see that the number of buildings with scores above 75 increased, which is important because a score of 75 um, qualifies a building to be certified. All right, so we also allow you to filter a portfolio of potentially hundreds of buildings to quickly identify assets that are scoring well and those that are not. And so if I dig in here, we have uh, leads selected. So I'm gonna filter this by the current certification score. Let's say I wanna highlight a top performer. By filtering up, I can do that. I have uh, this particular building uh, was a score of 91, uh, which is platinum. Now, if I want to see where I need to focus my attention, I may sort the other way. So this first building still needs to create its, its lead arc account. And the second one has a score of 54, which is silver. Um, and so relative to the other buildings in this portfolio, there's some, some progress to be made there. 
So combining all of these certifications into one place gives transparency to all the stakeholders tasked with driving portfolio performance through ESG initiatives. Before we move on to lead, I'm gonna pause and let Dan and Chris add their thoughts on the power of centralizing performance data. And, and Dan, I'll, I'll let you begin. I think this is great. I, this is the first time I'm seeing it. And, and you know, the thing that I like about all of this is it drives more transparency. We, we're using that word a lot, but it comes down to stakeholders. So if you see this internally at a company, it drives this competitive race to the top, right? I wanna be the 91. I wanna be the building owner, or I'm sorry, the manager uh, of, of that one or the asset manager. And if I'm the 54, huh, it's like, okay, how do I get to be like that one? And you know, I know that's the competitive dynamics and there's, there's business constructs and, and whatnot, but just being able to see things like this in this way is a really nice step forward. The data is the data. So it's there, it's, it's in a nice tight place. Good job. I really like this. Maybe I, I actually, I, I'm going to go down the road. I'm going to do the grass speak thing a little bit. I, what I love about this and what I love about the partnership that, that it represents is first and foremost, our goal in, in kind of working with you on this was to, was to really help the, help your customers have that hands-off experience that, that ability to, to do more with the data that they've got, whether they put it together for grasp or something else. And that's exactly what this did, does, which is really compelling. The thing is, when I think about how it goes to, to GRASP, we really want to meet, you're kind of leveraging the GRASP concept is basically saying, hey, you've got a data management system. Awesome. You are on your way to having energy ratings for every single standing asset. Great. And you are working your way through a series of third-party recognition, whether you are able to generate three or four scores to get up to get partial recognition for standing assets, whether you're taking an asset from new construction to an operating at a rating, like something else that Gress recognizes, or as you have over here on the right, your human experience, are you layering in occupant or employee surveys? Yet another place you can get Gress recognition. Mm -hmm. So there, there are multiple pathways here to both improve, A, as Dan said, make your asset more transparent and mm -hmm bring every asset along a journey, whether it's its first energy rating, its first partial green building certification, and uh, its first operating certification, or particular pieces of data like, like the, their surveys. And GRESP has a way for that to be reflected up to the investor in each of those components. So really nice to see that vertical integration that gives every owner and facility manager a way to, to, to create a more valuable asset as part of a more valuable company. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you both uh, for that commentary. And what we're going to do now is dig a bit deeper into lead, and then we will make our way to Grez uh, with both of these integrations. So in addition to collecting historic and current lead scores, Bracklet has integrated with the operational data needed to submit to lead. So I'm um, specifically looking over here on the right, which uh, Chris, uh, you just highlighted as well. Um, if you're in charge of improving lead scores in your building or portfolio, uh, it can be a mad rush to collect and submit the information. And so that, this is why we design tools uh, to make it easy to keep the data up to date. And we understand that uh, our users' plates are full so software can filter by data status, data submission status, uh, which allows them to focus their time and effort. And so I'm, I'm really focused over here on these right two columns where we can see both the status uh, of the building, but also the data submission status. So I'm gonna go ahead and show off a building that is doing well by filtering, um, by filtering uh, that column. And you can see here, green checks all down, uh, down those different categories and the status is certified. Now, if I filter the other way, what we can see here is that uh, this particular building data needs updating. Um, and specifically it appears a indoor air quality report. Um, and that is gonna be the CO2 report. So it makes it very easy to identify uh, what data is missing, which is incomplete. And so um, that's incredibly helpful for someone who is overseeing 
uh, lead score improvement. But the other thing, and, and we talked about this initially, great place to highlight it, uh, buildings are constantly changing. And keeping all of this data up to date is important uh, to keep track of, in this case, your lead performance score uh, that updates monthly as you update your information. So that's especially difficult when dealing with a lot of different types of information. So I'm gonna go into manage some of this information. Um, you can see that this particular building was completely updated, um, had completely updated statuses. And uh, you can see how the software brings all this information together um, in one place. And so this building was up to date but we would be notified if these fields needed to be addressed. And so this modal, we manage occupancy, operating hours, in addition to those indoor air quality reports. And when we were designing this, uh, at every step, the software, we designed it to streamline the data collection and even included the, uh, the link um, that ARC provides uh, for the survey. So, um, Shout out Chris and the ARC team with that one. Um, and that's accessible right here. And what we've done is we've actually automatically connected it, uh, this particular link to this site and to um, these data rollups. And so as tenants are, uh, and folks are replying to it, this data is automatically populating. The last piece is utilities. And so we automatically collect a building's utility information. A, a user can simply share their utility account and we will collect historic bills and automatically stream new bills into our software monthly. This allows users to keep track of their building's utility performance and address any issues that arise. So I'm gonna move into this building's utility dashboard to see in more detail that tracking. All right, so um, a user can use this screen to identify trends and anomalies in the utilities. So for instance, if I scroll down a little bit here, we can see in 2021, in January, there is an anomaly where if I click the alert manager, uh, water is above average and out of tolerance. It appears to be about 2000 gallons. And so, um, you know, identifying these issues as they happen and keeping data current is important to maintaining a building's ESG performance. Additionally, I want to highlight in the same screen, you can see how the utilities are integrated in one place with both Energy Star, LEED, and GRES. So now I'm gonna pause uh, after going through the, the lead portion of the demo and let Chris add his thoughts on the benefits of keeping all of this data up to date and current. Uh, Matt, this is great. I, a couple of things, and I had I, I can bring Dan. I hadn't seen, for instance, the uh, the, the transportation survey link in in all in the same place. So really nice to give the the user a streamlined environment to do the entire workflow. That's that's fantastic. I mean, one thing I think people don't to to your point, I think folks don't really appreciate how much how much either that advanced notice that real time tracking can help them get ahead of problems versus recognizing them at the end of the year and that issue of saying hey you know your performance really does vary and you're going for energy star recognition you're planning a lead recognition and you're getting ready for grasp it actually is true that your performance is changing month over month and, it, and the best way is to really keep an eye on it. Thus, you understand what normal looks like and you never are feeling like you're playing that kind of desperate, let me reconstruct the data game, which is no fun for anybody and it turns it all into a compliance exercise. So doing it the way you've shown it here turns it into every month, it's, it's a small marginal manageable amount of effort that never turns into that, that, that terrible buildup of a, of a year's worth of work all at one time. That's no fun. That's not what we're going for. <laughs> so, so Matt, thank you for you and your team for making it so attractive as well. 
Thank you, Chris. Uh, Dan, anything to add before we move into the Grez portion of the demo? I think you, you know, you measure what you manage. Sure, you manage what you measure, whatever. No, you improve it. You improve it. And I really like this. You know, at the end of the day, you're, there, there's money on the line. There's financials, right? You've acquired this building, you've got a pro forma, and you need to, to optimize everything as best you can in order to meet that pro forma. Having this early warning system like this is awesome. The, what the rating systems, whether it's LEED or GRASB or whatnot, that puts everything into context. Are you doing you know, better or worse than market? So I really like this building level uh, analysis and, and the ability to, to just get in there. I think this would be a great tool for a portfolio manager to understand where their opportunities lie and where some of their challenges exist. Appreciate it, Dan. And now let's move into the Grez integration uh, portion of the demo. So I've only heard about this from our tech guys. So now I'm going to see the proof in the pudding. <laughs> well, um, compliments to uh, to the full team. They made it. Um, uh, you know, we worked. We've been working with them for a while, and it's been a pleasure. And that goes for the Arc team as well. All right. So we moved over to Grez. So similar to Lead integration, we built the Grez rollup to give users a quick and easy way to keep up with their assets that may need attention. And so this comes in the form of this table. I really want to bring your attention to the synced column and the data submission column. And so this allows users to identify whether or not a asset, um, first, if it has all the required fields to sync with Grez, and then it also identifies buildings that still need to go finish or complete those missing fields. And so then we break that down further into a data submission status. And so Grez, we break it down from uh, the previous year, 2019 to 2020, and we show the total fields, their submission status. And then we are calculating and using the Grez APIs to identify any remaining errors or outliers that they can, um, they can address here in the software. And so, uh, I want to highlight that there is a lot of operational data that's needed for each asset. And so the concept here that we built off of was that central repository for data that can be used to uh, autofill fields and really ease the submission process. And so I'm going to jump into this building here. We're going to go manage its data. So the first thing you see is that autofill status. And so what this is saying is that we're gonna import and use data in Bracklet's platform to automatically fill in these fields. You can see that there's uh, statuses for each one of these fields that represents the different things that are going on as we validate these responses. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill this in. Awesome, okay. so. Um, also in the comments, the first person who uh, I really would like to see if anyone uh, gets the correct city and, and state of this, this address. All right, so we uh, just filled in the, the data from, from Bracklet. If we scroll down a little bit further, we can see the asset name and gross asset size. That's also been filled in automatically from Bracklet's data. And so what we have now is uh, the next step, which is some of the validation errors. So um, it can be easy to make errors while entering this information and users don't want to wait until everything is entered to necessarily QA these responses. That's why we allow users to get real time validation on the data that they're entering. And so let's say that I have uh, mistaken the construction year and what I'll get back is a, uh, an alert and it'll give me what the expected value is. And so this allows users really as they're typing to be able to validate and make sure that these responses are correct. And so next I'm going to go into another example here, the efficiency measures. So this is another um, category in the, the Grez submission. And so in 2020, we have broken, it, broken down by year. I can actually go ahead and if nothing has changed, I can copy from 2019 
and bring the statuses that were from 2019 into 2020 with a single click of a button. All right. Matt, question for you. Does, does yes. it, I mean, does it track what the efficiency measure of the technical assessment was? Like, does that document exist? So we do have the, um, we have the, the projects and the things that are happening uh, at the building under our investment decision lab feature um, that we'll, I'll definitely comment on towards the end of the presentation. Um, and so that data is accessible by these, uh, by these modals to know the true or false is um, on the efficiency measures. Perfect. All right. So, well, Dan, I'll, uh, I'll let you keep going. I wanted to pause here and um, ask for any other additional thoughts really on the benefits of this, uh, of keeping a central repository of operational data like you saw here in the, in the demo. Sure, well, I think this is great. And, and the data is hard, right? Getting in, I'm looking at the questions in the Q&A as well, right? So, you know, Gresb applies to lots of different conditions. So there's a question about how do you get this data from Chicago? And I'm sensing that there's probably a triple net lease situation where the utility in Chicago is not so forthcoming. And the second question has to do with single family, right? A whole nother group that's starting to show up in Gresb. So, you know, the market is hard. This is a very messy challenge that we're all trying to collectively fix. Chris, mm -hmm. about 20 minutes ago in this webinar, brought up, you know, lineage and timeliness and accuracy of data. So I really like how Bracklet has tackled, you know, the, the error uh, searching and reporting. Because what we do at Gresb is we're constantly pinging our database against the distribution curve to say, does this number that's about to be entered look correct or is it weird? It could be weird. Right, you could have a, an unoccupied building that is consuming very little data uh, or very little energy, right? So it's reporting a low number compared to its size. That's perfectly fine, right? But having those alerts that show up to say, hey, check this out, that's very important. So well done here. Um, at the end of the day, what institutional investors care about is, 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 is this accurate? Can I make some good decisions about it? And they also have stakeholders that they're reporting to. Carbon footprinting, is a thing for CalPERS, for New York Common Fund, for the Dutch. And so they're looking to pull this information up, not just from this particular Acme asset management firm, but all sorts of other LPs, or I'm sorry, GPs that are out there with their funds. So I think this is just a, a great roll-up tool. Thank you. And, um, you know, I know I did want to give a, a shout out to the Grez product and tech team as well. Uh, giving access to those that outlier information automatically as you're entering in the, the information that is hugely beneficial for users. So there was no way that we were going to leave that out. Cool. All right. Um, so ESG initiatives help teams measure where they are today and identify areas of improvement. And so the next step is to strategize and take action. This can be daunting and difficult to know where to start. Uh, luckily, Bracklet has tools uh, that, you know, for those who want to take that next step, um, please reach out to learn more about the other features and functionality that Bracklet offers. And we alluded to it, uh, Dan, with the, your question right before we, we jumped into uh, your response to the Grez demo. All right, so with that, we're gonna complete the the demo portion of the webinar. And we're gonna go ahead and move to some questions and answers. All right, so you go ahead and bring these up. So we have a, an initial uh, question uh, and that is how hard is it to migrate off of old systems to Bracklet? Um, so I definitely want to respond to that. Um, so Bracklet, what we do, and by virtue of having, uh, you know, the, the investments that ARC and Grez have made into their APIs, um, historical information, once Bracklet is given access to the account for ARC or Grez, we can pull, easily pull, automatically pull any historic um, submission data, um, whether it's the operational data or previous scores, and really pick up from where that user left off. 
Um, Chris or Dan, do you want to, I know we, we covered a bit of, you know, the, the why of the API. So do you have anything else to add there? I would just offer that, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, one of the biggest challenges we have come April is every once in a while there's turnover at organizations and mm -hmm. a portfolio that's meaning to move forward in Gresb all of a sudden stops. Mm -hmm. And you don't know why, right? Part of my job is to try to figure out why, but it, it's, it's difficult. So having this, you know, gee, there was turnover. Somebody else needs to step in here. That is a, a very important thing to not underestimate uh, when it comes to this exercise. Mm -hmm. So well done. Yeah, I'll only offer one quick tip just, just because this is this, I think it happens to any of us, you know, um, people change, organizations change. So we, we, and this is a really granular tip, but everybody who's using our, I think is, is getting to the idea where every organization or every project could have a master email account. So you can always reestablish connections. If you've done that, it's really easy and you don't have to edit, do any, any gymnastics on that I have to do for you. <laughs> but, uh, but, but to Matt's point, um, it is increasingly fluid to, uh, to, to move between systems, whether you used to be in, in portfolio manager or you were using a different vendor or you, you around as Dan said earlier, the data is the data. And I think we're all getting a lot better and a lot faster at, at if it needs to go through a spreadsheet and come back in the system, that's, that's not, that's not maybe what you experienced in the past as being a real pain point. It's pretty fast. It's really, it's really the persistent data connections that are, you know, where, where, where the activity is. And so, uh, and, and as, as Matt said, that's really going to an API based world. So the quicker you can get yourself out of your spreadsheets um, that may be locked away on your hard drive and into a solution like we've seen here, the, that's, that's really where the future is. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a great segue into our next question. Uh, question, which is a pretty fun one. Uh, how would you characterize the changes on how ESG initiatives will be measured, tracked, and acted upon in the next uh, five years? So maybe, you know, putting ourselves five years from now, looking into the future, how would you guys characterize that? Keep rolling, Chris. <laughs> so it's a good question how controversial I, mean. I you know, my, I, I, I know that Dan knows this, but I, I see us moving to a, a world where there are where, where we are increasingly fluid in moving data between the core data between platforms, energy, water, waste, transportation, human experience, these are gonna be bread and butter things. The question is uh, what I also see happening that makes the world a little harder is that the performance targets we're gonna need to hit, the ones that our assets need to hit are gonna get more granular and more and more place-based. So what you need to do in New York City is gonna be different than Copenhagen, gonna be different than Milan or different than Chicago. And I, I for, for, for better or worse, whether that is economically efficient or, or whatever it is, it is a world we have to live in. So the data I think will become more interoperable, more homogeneous, but the performance expectations will be more granular. And so we'll need these platforms to be able to help us say, hey, when the mayor of Chicago establishes a climate action plan with a certain trajectory and a certain set of requirements, you're going to need to meet those. They are probably going to be different than New York City and Washington, D.C. And, and London. There's probably no easy way to put all those things back in the bag. There, there are good reasons for them to be different. The things we can say for sure is the trend is toward real world measured performance data as being the coin of that realm. So whether you're giving it to Grass, you're giving it to CDP, or you're giving it to your, your public authority, that's going to be what it is. How you have to present it seems almost inevitably going to be in in more ways across those folks. So I think if you can kind of take the good and the bad of saying, hey, performance data is going to be increasingly important. The data itself, we're going to get our hands around that. The number of different people who want it in different slices and dices is, is yes, going to increase on us. That's, that's kind of my optic on the market right now. And I, I see that as global in scope. That is true if you're in Tokyo, London, Chicago, or Houston. The, that, that's the pattern we see all over the place. Mm -hmm. It depends. On, and so all of that <laughs> square. And the, you know, depends who the constituent is that's consuming the data. At the tenant level, people are concerned about occupancy costs, total occupancy costs and, and, and whatnot. At the institutional investor level, people are concerned about carbon. And we've all signed this Paris Agreement. Are we in? Are we out? Well, we're back in. And what does that mean? That means this. So how do you do that? And not only have we done that as countries, we've committed to the, this, 
right? We've also done this as companies. So more and more people are coming up with 2050, 2030, net zero. Well, what does that mean? And in order to do that, you've got to figure out this for your asset by asset trajectory. And you need to be directionally correct with the rest of your consumption to uh, offset that in some way, hopefully buying green electrons, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that performance game is two-sided. One is money, two is carbon. We are now, you know, moving very quickly. I think COVID has forced us in, into the digital age and is definitely pushing us down the carbon road. The whole conversation has changed in the ESG circles, as well as in the institutional investor circle on that, even though it's not priced. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Let me add one thing to what Dan said. Money, carbon, and the quality of the human experience in the space. I think that 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 third dimension of saying that's not just a that, that is increasingly a measurable thing. What we've learned from COVID is a, a lot greater uh, awareness that your <laughs> that going into that space is optional. So that space better protect your health. <laughs> <laughs> and at what exact, how we measure and communicate that, whether it's a CO2 measurement, an air quality thing or something else, we, it's a triple, it's a triple value proposition. You gotta, you gotta have a space that people are willing, i.e. Uh, ideally want to go into that is, that takes, that, that uses less carbon to operate and costs less for the bottom line. That's what a high quality asset looks like. We're going to be, we're going to spin around and find the right metrics for that. But I think that's my, it, it, for me, the post COVID the, the post-COVID trifecta of a superior real estate asset. Uh, I've got more. It's a quadfecta, Chris. You oh, wrote the you're resilience. Say resilience. What? So <laughs> wait a second. What about, what about climate risk? And is the asset resilient? And what's the story there? All right. I'll give you a four. I'll give you a four. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a thing, right? And so is this asset, uh, you know, going to stand the test of, of what we're looking at? And um, yeah, it needs to be healthy. It needs to uh, continue to operate. Those are other issues as well. Okay. And I want to I want to highlight, um, you know, and piggyback of off what both of you just said. There's a increased expectation. I think Chris, you said that the the bar is is only getting higher, and so this is putting a lot of pressure on folks who own and operate buildings, and they want to know, you know. Now that they, you know, if they've gone through and they've um, standardized how they collect the information, they want to know what to do next. How can they strategize and deterministically make um, improve the performance of their buildings? And so, I did want to take the opportunity that um, to say that Brackless platform is a holistic one, and so we allow users to grow on that journey with us. And so, really, it's the measure know where the improvements are, and then what's the next step? How do we go and make changes, invest in our, our uh, assets to really, and deterministically know what the, the returns and the savings are going to be when these, these uh, downward pressures on performance are coming, coming in and they need to know with certainty um, what the future performance, if they place and if they make these improvements are. And so Bracklet has other features and product tiers that allow customers to really grow on that journey with us. So I did want to take the opportunity to say, as things, these dynamics are changing, uh, Bracklet has invested in and has solutions to help customers do that. Matt, I'm glad you brought that up because that's not something that Grez does. We highlight the problem mm -hmm. and we look for, I mean, what we, uh, solution providers exist to come and, and deal with those problems. So. Well done, right? We need well, mm -hmm. more of that. And, and, and you know, that's what the industry needs is, is asset managers need a tool to say, okay, I get it, right? Now I understand where we are compared to some uh, a peer group. What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. What should we do? And how does that work within the confines of an economic business plan mm -hmm. and return expectations and all of those things? So it's a big triangula triangulation exercise. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so good job with your software. We don't yeah. do it either, to be clear. So uh, we're on the same boat. We we recognize leadership, but we are not the people that are going to get you there. So we rely exactly as Dan said, very similar model on our partners like mm -hmm. Bracklet to get the use to to help the 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 end users 
find those opportunities for improvement. We'll tell you what you get when you improve, but we're not going to tell you how to get there. So that's that's exactly the same. And that just underscores, you know, again, uh, both of the investments in the APIs is really creating that that centralized data source, that interoperability that is allowing these end, end users to um, to make those investments and and you know, take the first step on that journey. Um, I do worth, think it's worth saying um, that in all of this, you know, just everyone here would agree that, uh, you know, maximizing returns as they're investing in improving performance and improving their ESG is not mutually exclusive. You know, it's actually good for business. The number one issue that I get is the reporting burden. Drive down the reporting burden, please. Mm -hmm. Right. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll take that one more way. I mean, if you go to the ARC website and you look under resources, you'll find an impact tab that building on what Matt said, that impact tab clearly shows from thousands of projects, 15,000 projects around the world that they're, that they're, that the best project teams can deliver dramatic emissions reductions with better occupant satisfaction. That's what's possible when you use these tools the right way. So that just to say, hey, when you have these data, you can do some myth busting and, and you can and you actually can see these benefits when you work with smart people. And we're not we're not we're not hypothesizing those benefits are there. We're showing you those benefits from thousands of teams around the world. Mm -hmm. The flywheel starts and then you start to raise more capital to deploy more capital in a thoughtful way. And here we go. Making progress. Bingo. Um, all right, La I think uh, we'll probably have time for one or two more questions here. Um, I did want to take a, a question. Are you able to set up portfolios for the property list in addition to the entire entity list? For example, if we want to consult for multiple portfolios, are we able to break out a single portfolio? So um, I'm not going to jump back to the demo, but absolutely yes. So you saw that filter where you can create different entities, different combinations of buildings to report on. We absolutely support that. So I, that was an easy, easy yes. <laughs> Matt, there's three other questions in the Q&A. One of them has to do with other, you know, other areas where data comes in, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, like BOMA, you know, and I'm thinking especially in Canada, right? Where, where BOMA best is a, is a mm -hmm. thing. So do you have aspirations of, of dealing with those? We do, yep. Um, so, you know, as, as, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're a software company. And so uh, we really see ourselves as that holistic platform to enable users who want to go on that journey to be able to use their data um, and support, um, you know, let's say the initiatives, the, the certifications that they want for their buildings, ultimately to uh, be able to report up. Again, I love that analogy uh, that we said earlier. Uh, report up on their performance in addition to the financial performance. So there's all of this data that's getting collected and standardized that is now being asked for to assess uh, asset performance and value. And so we want to be the platform that helps users and streamlines that process. Okay, um, one more minute left. Uh, so I am going to and our end it there. Um, I want to thank Chris and Dan for your participation today. Um, this was a had an excellent discussion. We are very excited to um, to have you both on today and have uh, you guys give your thoughts and opinions on where do we stand today and uh, where are we going next. And so I uh, couldn't be happier to to have this discussion this afternoon. Future's bright. Thanks for having me, Matt. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Excited to see, to, excited for people to put this to work. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone.